Welcome to the Wavingston Clergy Clatch, a weekly online Bible study discussing the upcoming Sunday readings. The conversation is led by the Rev. Sven Van Bars from Abingdon, the very Rev. Gary Barker from Kingston Parish, and myself, the Rev. Scott Parnell of Ware Episcopal Church. Well, good morning, Gary. Good morning, Scott, and welcome to this, the Wavingston Clergy Clatch. And today we're discussing the readings for the fourth Sunday in Lent. Uh, they are from Numbers, a passage from the letter to the Ephesians, and a passage from the third chapter from John's Gospel. So uh, let us start. I'll read the Numbers passage. This is from the 21st chapter of Numbers. Uh, from Mount Hor, the Israelites set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against God and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpent, serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a, up on a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Ouch. <laughs> So, what about your serpents? What about your uh, understanding of this? I actually love when this comes up every year, or, or often anyway. Um, uh, the, because, uh, yeah, I, I read Richard Rohr's daily meditations, and he's talking right now about how, how we live out of our expectations so much that we don't see beyond our expectations. And this just is beyond my expectations. It's, it's, it's like not that long after uh, God says, don't build any graven images, you build this bronze poisonous serpent and somehow it does this magic for people. Um, and um, so, so it, it makes me have to rethink things. And then later we're gonna see even, even it's going to even be compared to Jesus on the cross, this snake, this bronze snake. Um, and uh, so I think it's healthy uh, to just have to have to step outside of what we know. And of course, the, the main point of, of what this is about, I think, is that the fact that people are whining because they, they were brought out of slavery into freedom and it's not working out the way they wanted it to. Mm -hmm. And it's not feeling very good. And it, um, it's a, it, there's a little more wilderness involved in freedom than they had hoped for. And so the, the whole, the, the people are having their, their expectations blown out and they're having to think uh, of, of a God far beyond what they expected and realize that their lives are gonna be far beyond what they expected. Mm -hmm. I look at this and I think somebody's mixing their metaphors here and that <laughs> we have just gone way too far and that someone, someone started telling a story, right? And it, they just kept going and eventually they got way too far down and they realized we just need to just stop there and back on up, right? And I, I'm with you, Gary, 100%, right? That I enjoy when this reading comes up in the lectionary cycle because that means I know what the gospel lectionary is going to be. And it's going to be John 3.16, right? And that I get excited about that. But then, and I love the connection between the two of the serpent being raised up and Jesus being raised up. You look at the serpent, you're healed. You look at Jesus, you're healed. But then we remember that it's a serpent, right? The thing that caused the whole problem in the first place and Jesus, the thing that fixes the problem. <laughs> and that it's sort of like, 
we could have picked any other animal, right? Why, why not a bronze scorpion, right? Let the scorpions go out and start attacking people. Why a snake, right? And that it just, I don't know, it's bizarre. I love it, but it's bizarre. Yeah, yeah. It should have been a corn dog. It should have been a corn <laughs> dog because they naturally belong up on the street. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Well, for me, it it, uh, it reminds me one of the one of the commentaries I listen to on occasion is from Luther Seminary, and one of the Old Testament professors there says there's this pattern in the Old Testament that God makes a covenant, the people live nice and happily, then they fall away, they complain, God gets mad, they they repent, they forgive, and so the cycle begins all over again. This cycle of God loves us, but that's not enough. We want we want more. We want more assurance or more something. And so um, it's sort of this this pattern. The food is lousy. You know, the, the the water is lousy. We got to walk too far. You know, I know we're going to the promised land, but you know, can can you give us a better ride or something? Um, and so, but for for me, it reminds me of that of that pattern. And I think that pattern is one that a lot of people of faith today struggle with. It's not it's not you know the the uh, people coming get bit by physical serpents or looking up, but that pattern of, of walking in God's goodness and then sort of getting complacent with it, sort of saying, oh yeah, this is, you know, I've, I've got a warm house to live in and I've got food and gosh, couldn't I have better house or better food? And, and then struggling with, you know, being unhappy with the blessings and then sometimes falling away. It's like, you know, I, I, so I, I see this as a, as a metaphor for a pattern of faith of how do we trust in God? And I think the metaphor of the serpent is, is a horrible one also. You know, it's just, <laughs> I don't, the image of the serpent, so I agree. <laughs> I think that complacency, I, what I think of when I hear the word complacency right now is um, an Instagram ad, right? And I don't believe I'm admitting this right now. On my Instagram, every now and then this like ad comes up for some gla like glasses people can put on and it helps people who are colorblind see the colors that they see. And like there's this like really long drawn out dramatic video where they get dad who's been colorblind these glasses for his birthday, he puts them on and he's sort of reduced to tears. Mm -hmm. And part of me is like, oh my gosh, that's so amazing. And then this sort of complacent side of me of like, it's the color red. We see this every day. And that how how much we take that for granted if you're not colorblind. And that if you are colorblind, you understand what I'm saying, where it's sort of like this miraculous thing that we just sort of accept is what it is. That I, I remember um, when I was little watching Wizard of Oz. Um, I'm young enough that black and white TV didn't exist, right? Everything was in color. And I remember the first time, like, walking up to the television screen and tapping it, trying to understand why Dorothy in Kansas was in black and white. Because I had, whether I had seen a credit of the movie, like, it was the yellow brick road. It was supposed to be yellow. <laughs> why wasn't it yellow? It was black and white. And that this sort of complacency with miraculous things that we see every day, but they're not miracles because they're so common. Mm -hmm. We've, we've lulled Gary into complacency. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. are, you, are you tempted to preach on this passage alone without the John passage? Ex execute a good understanding of this and, uh, and, and not sort of have the, the complementary, which is wonderful passage from John 3.16? I think I could do it. You ready for this? All right. Okay. I think that you could preach a sermon on um, essentially facing fear, mm -hmm. right? The, the thing that caused our downfall is the thing that we have to turn and face in this moment and that we have to acknowledge, we have to acknowledge our brokenness before we can be healed from it, right? That the, the serpent that has come and bit each one of us um, metaphorically, in their case, literally, um, is the same serpent that we have to name that exists by turning to the bronze one, because then we're open up to healing. 
But Jesus makes it a lot better story, let's be honest. Yes, I agree, always. <laughs> <laughs> and Gary, what about you? Would you, would you? Uh... Well, that, yeah, I mean, I think I'd stick to the, the miserableness of the, the earlier part that everybody is complaining about things not being the way they want them to be. Um, I, I, it, it, those of us that are rectors have certainly heard that somewhere along the way from, from members of our congregation. Maybe mm -hmm. all of us are pretty good at doing it ourselves, but uh, uh, um, that, that sense that maybe, maybe today in the middle of pandemic, not being able to touch each other, um, and, and not being able to get together and just have a, 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 a good social time together or worship together in person. Um, maybe this is the moment God has given us and it may look a lot like wilderness, but it's also glory. Um, and uh, so I think that's kind of kind of where, where I'd preach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, having asked the question, I didn't have an answer in mind for that. So I would tend to go, um, in the, in the midst of pain and suffering, God is also present with, with promise of hope. And it's, it's interesting that with, uh, I mean, so here Israelites are in the desert, they're making a image. Um, they've done that before. The difference this time seems that there is no recording that they begin worshiping the, the bronze serpent. It's like they see that as a, if you will, a sacramental understanding of God's presence. And so whereas the golden calf they make becomes the idol, it seems like they recognize that they've learned that this um, this bronze image held up high is not sacred in itself, but it's a it's a it's a it's an icon. It's a it's a sacrament toward not not the big writ sacrament, but it's a it's an outward understanding of a of a presence of God. All right, but luckily we don't have just the Exodus the Numbers text. We've got a wonderful reading um, from our, our good letter to the church in Ephesus. So Scott, I say one more thing about Numbers. Like this is like one of the only two good stories in the book of Numbers, right? The rest of it is all census and counting. And you get this, numbers, yeah. <laughs> you get this, and you get the story of Balaam and the donkey, right? Th those are the only two things I remember from the book of Numbers. So. To the listeners, once you've read this and once you've read Balaam, like, you got it. <laughs> you can move on to Deuteronomy. I agree. I, I agree. And now that we have uh, alienated our, our accountant constituency, our, our auditors and accountant constituency of listening to the Wabington podcast. <laughs> yes. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> and the math teachers, of course. <laughs> All right. This is from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, uh, beginning of the second chapter, first verse. Paul writes, you were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in our passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses. And we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. I like it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's resurrection hope in, in, uh, in these times. I like how it is a a little synopsis, like a nugget of, of the gospel message, recounting uh, the story of Christ and then also binding us with it uh, for, that, for that future time, um, somewhere in the passage, it says for the age to come. And so binding us all, so it has this, has this, has this what has been, what is, and what will be quality to it. 
um, linking up then with the, with the methods of price, price for beaming work? Uh, the magic word is grace. And uh, if, if serpents, bronze serpents blow our minds, then grace really blows our mind. And um, th this idea that there is something um, so full and rich of love that, that it, it will bring us to fullness of life in spite of ourselves. Um, uh, it, uh, is always challenging for us because we, we want to make sense of it and we want to do the right thing and make it all right. And um, instead, God gives us grace. And uh, so it's, uh, it's such a, it's, he, you know, it, this Ephesian passage does such a beautiful job of standing us in front of that um, and, and taking away all our expectations and giving us something uh, beyond us. I think back to your comment about the, the serpent, the bronze serpent being a sacramental indicator. And I, the grace, the experience of grace, the encounter with grace, that I think because of our temporal existence, truly that we as human creatures are subject to time and space, that we, we need tangible things to be conveyors of grace. Not because um, we, God is bound by that, but because we are bound by that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think more about the process of rather than the looking at the bronze serpent, the casting of the bronze serpent. Right, that it's somebody at some point had to go collect a bunch of bronze and make a mold, fire it all up and make this thing. Mm -hmm. And to me, that, that action and work of building the serpent to me is the ministry that Christians are called to today. Mm -hmm. Not because we're like literally supposed to go build a bronze serpent, but that we are to be the, the hands that cast this thing that is healing to other people mm -hmm. and that we we are the conveyors of grace in the world mm -hmm. um, and i think that it's a uh, something really um i think just as big of a concept as grace is the fact that god sort of says here go do this right that's just as kind of like wow <laughs> mm -hmm. one of the things i want for in in my work in the community and and church is the use of pronouns among group members. And so if I'm on a board and a board member says, you know, what you need to be doing instead of what we need to be doing, I sort of watch for that as an understanding of include, like a vestry member. If the vestry member is saying to the rest of the vestry, you know, what the, what the church needs to do, what you need to do is X, um, rather than saying what we need to do. And so it's sort of indicating of whether they are accepting that. And so I'm mindful when in this letter, when the writer says, um, and raised us up with him to the seat in the highest heavenly places, um, that action of God with, with him being Jesus. But it's not you, uh, it's in us. And so the, the writer is, is not saying that grace is something for you to understand, but rather it's this inclusive statement that I'm part of as the writer, that you as the hearers are part of, and that God is the author of, of that grace, not the letter, but the grace is part of. And so it's this, it's this ownership that I think is essential to our faith. It's, it's, you know, it's, I'm an Episcopalian or a Christian, not because my parents were, because my neighbors are, but because I understand what this means for me. And I try to convey that to others as well. So that little pronoun is what, what snags me and gives me hope. That um, probably most everybody has heard the the little um, poem that was written on a cellar wall of, of by some Jewish people who were hiding from the Nazis in the Second World War, and it, it's been found. And actually, our choir sometimes sings a song of it. But um, I believe the sun is shining. Is is there even when it's not shining? I believe that 
that God is present even when I, I do not f feel it. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that since the grace um, comes even in the darkest moments, um, that, uh, that the grace is, is that knowing the sun is there even at those days in February when we didn't see the sun. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, and um, it, it, there's something so grounding about that, that, that if we can find that place, it's the peace that passes understanding that just stays with us mm -hmm. um, and can bring us through all kinds of rough, rough roads. Mm -hmm. And we got grace and faith. I, I'd much rather have grace and faith than serpents and bronze. I'll just go on record as saying that. <laughs> Good. Well, do we want to move on to our passage from John's Gospel? Okay. So. Okay, Gary, lead us in that. Here's the passage you've all been waiting for. This is from John 3, 14 to 21. Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. There you go. Such an iconic passage, um, and I will just say that I have found this passage sometimes to be used as a as a club rather than an invitation by some of our fellow Christians. And so I often am called to preach on it just so I, I don't leave it in the hands of the more evangelical Pentecostal um, branches of Christianity so that you know, we Episcopalians are not, not afraid to have this. And so I just, before I get into the text, I just have that personal observation of, of where I sort of encounter, encounter this. And I think, I mean, I 100% agree with you, Sven, and I think it's because they leave out verses 17 and 18. I right. mean, really, because they don't leave out the whole thing, but they've got to get to the rest of the story, right? right. That they stop at 316 when I hate to say it, I think it's verse 18 is the one that really matters. Yes. Yes. And that, I mean, if I were to, to drop this sort of in a cosmic, well, let me put it this way. Um, we were doing some work on our pavilion out at the church and the, um, the inspector guy came and was taking a look at it and so I got to make a small talk. And I said, oh, you should come to church one Sunday, right? I'm doing my good evangelism tool. And he's like, well, I don't really do that. And I said, oh, well, tell me about it. And um, I mean, basically he was like, well, as you said, Christians have used the Bible as a club, mm -hmm. not a social club, but a like bat club. Right. <laughs> and have beaten people up over it. They've taken things that aren't theirs. They've hurt people. They've tried to sanctify evil things in the name of God. And it's just sort of like, yeah, 
100% agree with you. And it was, it was really interesting to hear um, someone, maybe this sounds bad, and maybe I'm stereotyping here, but this is an older gentleman and I was talking to, right? That it wasn't some new agey, like beat bopper from, that are in their like 20s on their social justice war train, right? But this was a guy that had like lived life and that you could tell that there was a lot of contemplation, a lot of hurt behind it. And that here we are, um, I mean, I, I would wonder how he would engage with this, right? Would he hear John 3.16, and make the association and let that be the end of it. And that to put it in the rest of the context, so I sort of talked to him about Plato and Plato's dialogue of Timaeus and sort of how sort of the early church sort of began to identify some of this with the philosophical understanding, blah, 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 blah. And that I think this passage lends it to that, which is we inherit a world without God, each of us do. And that that is the world that we are born into, not because God isn't in the world, but that we just don't see it. We can't see it. And that um, it is that desire then that pulls us closer and closer to God, that we're not condemned, or that God isn't doing the action of condemning, that we're already condemned. We're already destined to a life without God, unless we decide to not make it about us. And that this, the minute that we do that, then we step, we begin stepping into the light, right? That we, we start to pursue what is true, as it says. And that in the same way that the bronze serpent is the practical way that this gets worked out for the Israelites, I think Christianity in its true form, and that's not saying that I have it all figured out or even that the Episcopal Church has it all figured out or that any Christian denomination has it all figured out, but that Christianity, what we're grasping at, is the articulation and practical working out of that grace, right? That, not to say the bronze serpent statue, it was a serpent, right? At some level, that means that if Moses had said, well, I'm not really a fan of snakes, I think I'm going to do uh, turtle doves instead, right? Well, that's not what God said, <laughs> right? Moses, you don't get to make that choice, that God picked a very particular way to work things out in the world, and that it's our job and task to, well, craft that uh, staff or the serpent, and to sort of then turn and look at it once we get bitten by a snake. And that this seems to be um, sort of opening that very practical thing into a more sort of philosophical understanding of what our experience as humans is. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we, I think we sometimes uh, oversimplify this to the magic level of like the serpent. You know, the, um, if you just hold up a crucifix, <laughs> you can make that that devil disappear. You can you can be all right. Um, and uh, if that somehow just the fact that Jesus died on the cross. Um, solves everything and that we don't have to do anything and there's that this other side to the grace in the ephesians that that we have to be changed we have to move we have to do things to live into this redemption um and uh it's it's not a matter of magic of of god magically making it all right you know, it, and it almost goes with what you were saying, Scott, about God being outside the world and sort of being the magician that fixes everything. Mm -hmm. That's not what it's about. It's about God being so intimately connected into me, even, that, that I need to be changed into being intimately connected into God in ways that, that I have not been taught that in ways that I do not automatically do at all because I love the darkness too much um, uh, without even realizing it. Well, one of the points here that I bring up is, is one of the key verbs in this passage for me is the word believe. Um, and John's gospel uses believe a whole lot, the, the New Testament does in general, does a whole lot. Um, but belief is, whereas I think today I'm more inclined, I think I'm not alone in this, I'm more inclined to think belief is an idea 
in John, belief is a verb. It's not a concept. It's not, and it just, this dovetails into what both of you are saying, um, but it, it is, what are those actions that you are? And in this passage, I think it's underscoring that by saying, you know, those who come into the light, those who, as, as Scott was saying, uh, when you have to look at the serpent, you have to acknowledge it. So there's, a, there's an action that is part of this life of faith. And so, you know, for me to sit back on my couch and drink my coffee and say, yeah, I believe, um, is really not what this passage is talking about. It's like, how do you get off, off that couch and, and have your actions um, uh, bespoke your, what, your, what your beliefs are, what your, what your uh, conviction is? And so whether that is doing good works as a result of your belief or whether it is actively looking inward at yourself and seeing where the places you're drawn to the light and then consciously amending to move yourself uh, toward the light. And so I think it's that, it's that concept of, it's just not believing, it's just not holding an idea, say, yeah, I, I cognitively assent to that proposition, but actually saying, what are the ways that my life is being patterned? What are the verbs that I'm doing in other ways that are integrated into this verb believe? Yeah, it seems like, I mean, so what you're talking about, Sven, is sort of saying, okay, I've been bitten by the snake, mm -hmm. right? It's one thing to say, yeah, there's this thing over here I can look at and make it all better. I really believe that that's true, but I'm just going to not do that. Cool. Or you can actually turn and look at it. Right. <laughs> right? And right. That, that I think that we've missed, yeah, that, oh, I believe in God. Well, if you believe in God, right, you got to show up. <laughs> you got to do the things that God tells us to do. Yeah. yeah. I love the very last line of this passage. Are you doing deeds that have been done in God? Um, because for me, it's more than doing things for God or doing things because God told me that, that I should do them. It's, it's living completely into God and, and, uh, it's 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 an organic process. It's a it's a way of growing into being that that takes time. Um, it's it's reading, marking, learning, and inwardly digesting scripture, and not just beating people over the head with the Bible, uh, sort of thing. So if people are bit by the Bible, don't they look up at the Bible on the, on the pole, the bronze Bible up on the pole? <laughs> I think they, I think either way would be good. So again, mixing up all these bad metaphors, <laughs> I'm going back to Scott's comment. <laughs> it is. No, I, I'm, I'm still just taken aback by the, the intermingling of the serpent and Jesus. Mm -hmm. and that, I mean, I, I don't necessarily think that the serpent carries the same connotation all the way through. And that I think the, the New Testament certainly doesn't vilify snakes. And in some ways, I don't hear it as maybe their primary story. Or may, moreover, it might just be that as we've heard it as Christians, is sort of this initial story that sort of kicks it all off with the serpent that becomes the foundational understanding of the serpent, right? That how many times have we heard people call, oh, well, Eve was tempted by Satan. And it's like, well, that's not what the story says. It yeah. simply just says it was a serpent. Granted, the snake could talk, but it was just a snake, right? It was by its very nature, the most crafty of all the animals. Mm -hmm. So it's part, it was part of the creation, too. So. Yeah, and called good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the things a couple of years ago when I preached on this, uh, uh, afterwards, of course, you celebrate Eucharist and you lift up the bread. Mm -hmm. And uh, and, um, and so to make that connection, I, I grew up for a while uh, uh, as a Roman Catholic, and of course there's the monstrance and the uh, and and um, the honoring of the, of the real presence uh, 
uh, in, in very specific ways in that tradition. Um, uh, and some of that gets connected up in this in ways that, that is confusing to me maybe. But, uh, but uh, there's also something about that that's, that's, uh, that's powerful. Well, there is. I mean, and yeah, I, I, I completely agree with that. Our, and we still have that high, high uh, authority of being able to see something. You know, so if you can sacramental, but also just that presence of being seen and known. And to what degree is that connected in these concepts? Well, well Jalen, thank you very much. It's going to be a, a good Sunday to execute some passages and hope our discussion has helped those who have heard whatever sermon they're hearing on this fourth Sunday of Lent to have a deeper understanding of these of these texts. I'm going to, today is my turn to close us with prayer. I'm going to pray the collect for this Sunday. So the Lord be with you. Also with, with you. you. Let us pray. And gracious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread, which gives life to the world, evermore give us this bread, that he may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen. See you next week. Very good. Bye, y'all.